talk to all of you. Uh, I guess as the acting head of the monitoring at Ames, it's kind of really nice to come and give you a first-hand account of what we've been up to for the last year. Um, we finished our season recently, and um, without further ado, if this will work, that's a good start. There we go. So, um, what I'm going to show you is a collaboration of a lot of people's work, um, the, the monitoring team, obviously, but also the Brubs team at Ames. Um, some causal, coral physiology and genetics, and also um, Terry and James Kerry have contributed some data to some of the figures I'll show you here. And we couldn't do it without the great support we get from our research vessels. I'll give you a brief outline of what I want to talk about. So uh, in January this year, we got funding from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation to go up and set up permanent monitoring sites in the far north. Um, so that'll take up uh, a big portion of this talk. I think it's pretty timely to um, talk about the status of that far northern region given the obvious recent impacts up there. Then we recently released our annual update which talks about the status of the GBR as a whole. Um, so I'll, I'll run you through that. You've probably seen it but um, I'll update that. And then I want to put all of that into a temporal context of the entire GBR. Uh, so the whole LTMP temporal series and, and just discuss what the implications are for potential reef recovery. So the far northern surveys, I'm sure you've all heard there's a rim rent process underway which is going at glacial pace, but during that process was identified that there was a, a lack of robust monitoring in the far north of the GBR. Uh, we've been up there kind of manitowing for 30 odd years, but it's been fairly haphazard. Um, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority um, also do their risk surveys up there and there's been a couple of projects like the uh, CBD Catlin surveys and reef life surveys also go up there. But in terms of repeatable robust monitoring, there's a real paucity of information from that far northern area. So we saw an opportunity to uh, hit the GDRF up for, for money and they came to the party. Um, and enabled us to put together this multidisciplinary expedition on board the, the largest ship in our fleet of two, uh, the Solander. <laughs> it was the first time the Solander has actually been in GBR waters, so um, it, was, uh, it was actually really nice to work off. And uh, as I mentioned, the components of this expedition were the, the usual LTMP surveys, um, some brub surveys, but also some experimental work looking at coral physiology and uh, genetics in, in uh, the time since the bleaching. Uh, I won't touch on those results, I'll be focusing mostly on stuff that I know about. So the first component of our far northern surveys were our broad scale manitos, uh, where we basically categorise reefs uh, according to their percent hard coral cover. If you're not familiar with the technique, an observer gets towed behind an inflatable boat around the perimeter of a reef. To complete a, a, a whole reef, we use two boats. You both start at the same point. One goes clockwise, one goes anti-clockwise till you get to the other end. And it's comprised of a series of two-minute tows. You can see these squiggly lines here represent the geo-reference tow path. And at the end of those two-minute tows, um, the observer records the data uh, for that tow. And that's colour coded by um, categories of percent hard coral cover. We also record information on crown of thorns starfish, so they're represented by these little stars here, and other stuff like soft coral cover, dead coral, um, crown of thorns starfish, as I mentioned, coral trout, and sharks. But I'll be focusing mainly on the hard coral cover results. <coughs> So we managed to get around and survey 17 reefs up in the far north from Princess Charlotte Bay up to Cape Grenville. Of those, two had low coral cover, 10 had moderate, and um, five had high, so up to 50%. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to do the inshore reefs as uh, we had lots of uh, interactions with crocodiles, and as I'm sure you can appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> Little meal. So, in the interest of safety, we, we forewent the uh, inshore reef manitos. Um, and we also struck some bad weather towards the end of the trip when that horrible low that we all know about so well was sitting in the Gulf here and, and battening us with 30, 35 knots. So, we missed out on a couple of surveys up there. Um, as I said, it, it was 
kind of disappointing we missed those inshore reefs as they were pretty badly affected by the bleaching. And these are the results from the previous surveys we did. And as you can see, they're all very low to low coral cover. So um, that will have an impact on, on the kind of region-wide results. Um, and in terms of changes since the last surveys, we saw declines on nine of the reefs. We had increases on two and the rest were, uh, had no change. So obviously some you know, fairly strong evidence of impacts from disturbances. Okay, we also conduct uh, intensive surveys along fixed transects. For the benthic communities, we use digital imagery to quantify um, the benthos and uh, we take an image every metre and then analyse that back in the lab. And so the results from, we managed to do seven reefs with intensive surveys. Uh, from the broad taxonomic categories, you can see that all of these reefs are pretty much dominated by algae. There's variable amounts of hard coral cover between about 12 and 40%, um, and pretty much low soft coral cover across the whole place, apart from this mid-shelf reef in Cape Grenville. You can further break down the benthic communities into families of coral, and as is pretty usual on the GDR, proper is uh, the dominant category on most reefs. Apart from this reef here, 11049, which is a mid-shelf reef just off Cape Grenville, and it had um, very obviously suffered badly during the bleaching. Um, so virtually no acropora, no fossil operidae, and the, the remnant um, corals there were provided in other massive corals. And you can also see the prevalence of algae across all of these reefs. So indications there of um, quite a, a good amount of degradation on a lot of these reefs. And when you plot that out in multivariate space, this is an MDS, it pretty much shows a pattern that's been consistent uh, from all of our data across the, the Great Barrier Reef to where it areas to the south. There's very strong structure across the shelf. So this first dimension shows a grouping of the mid-shelf reefs here um, and the standout being 11049, which was dominated by just the priorities with very little acropora. And all the outer shelf communities were basically very, very similar in terms of composition and dominated by the acropora montipora and isophora. Another aspect of our surveys is that we also count juvenile corals, so all those kind of less than five centimetres um, gives us some sort of indication of um, I guess the potential for future recovery at least. And you can see that um, there's variable amounts on them, but they're all kind of uh, greater than uh, eight per square metre, and in some cases getting up to 28. So um, some good numbers of juveniles there. Unfortunately, we're unable to say when these guys actually settled. Were they remnants from before the bleaching or have they settled out afterwards? Um, but I think we can all acknowledge that certainly <coughs> the amount of settlement that's happened since the bleaching has been substantially reduced compared to previous decades, as has been shown from the centre here. And I suspect that a lot of these are probably remnants from um, either before the bleaching or just after it. And when you put the far northern sectors into the context of the rest of the GBR, so here they are on the left here, and uh, the sectors go north to south, left to right, you can see that the levels of hard coral cover are, are pretty similar to what's found across the rest of the GBR. Okay, so now I've nervously got beyond what's not my speciality, I'll move on to my pet, which is fish communities. So we use standard underwater visual techniques across um, belt transects uh, and record uh, from a list of about 220 species where we record abundance and estimate length. Basically the take home message is that it's, it's a really abundant, diverse fish assemblage in the far north of the GBR. There was some evidence of some latitudinal decrease in total abundance, but this was largely driven by uh, the damselfish here. Um, species richness was similar across uh, all of the seven reefs we managed to survey. And I guess the only other real um, thing of note is the higher abundance of a number of groups of fishes in green zones compared to adjacent reefs that are open to fishing. So coral trout, 
the Lathrinids, the Lejanids, and even the Scarrots. And when you actually do the contrast matrix from these models, um, this indicates the difference between green and blue zones where anything to the right of this line is more in the green zone, you can see that there was statistically significant more of these groups of fishes in green zones, which is, um, I guess, a little unexpected given some of the previous work that showed that green zones weren't particularly effective except in some locations, like I think it was the outer. But this was across all, uh, all groups um, and really goes to show that, you know, locking up enough reef inside no tape marine reserves is an effective tool even in these far remote localities. You can then also plot out the community structure and I guess the only thing to say about this is again you get that really cross shelf um, spatial structure to the assemblages um, with mid shelf reefs uh, a little more diverse than the off shelf communities. And then again, a comparison to the rest of the GBR, even though the uh, variation is particularly large in a lot of these cases, there's moderate evidence to suggest that the abundance and diversity is slightly higher than the rest of the GBR throughout most of the groups. And um, it's particularly interesting to note that the coral trout populations are similar to the highest that we've seen down in the Swains and the Pompeys. So it looks like this far northern uh, GBR region is particularly uh, species but also abundant in terms of fish communities. Uh, we also managed to throw quite a few brubs over the side, so if you're not familiar with them, they're just a camera attached to a frame with a baited arm out the front. You soak them for an hour and then um, some poor sap has to analyse the videos afterwards. And from these we did something like, I think it was 170 odd um, deployments. We got over 11,000 individual fishes from a whole range of uh, orders of fish, equating to 31 families of Persiformes and a whole raft of um, other groups. Uh, the good thing about brubs is they give us a really good indication of those groups of fishes that you, you don't get um, good data on from underwater visual sensors, given the you know the observer bias is inherent in that technique. And particularly, we got very large numbers of sharks, including grey reefies, but also um, big mama tiger sharks like this. Um, we didn't get in the water after seeing that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it looks like the far north. Um, has really, really like high populations of particularly the reef sharks, but also larger predators like the tigers, and we saw a number of hammerheads just on the surface as well. And when you look at um, broad summary statistics, this is uh, the number of species and uh, the relative abundance. Basically what it's saying is it's backing up what we saw on the EVC. The, um, <coughs> The average number of species and the average abundance was pretty much a little bit higher than the rest of the GBR averages, which is the orange and the yellow um, boxes there. So again, just reinforcing that the north is, is looking really good in terms of fish communities. <clears throat> Another way of breaking this down is to um, go to the multivariate suite of analyses. This is a boosted regression tree. And again, it just reiterates the point that the strongest break in assemblage structure of fishes is across the shelf. So you have this cluster here of mid-shelf reefs and um, then the rest of them are, are out of shelf. And boosted regression trees also allow you to look at the drivers, the environmental drivers of the breaks in those communities. Um, as I said, the first one here is just the distance across the shelf. But uh, within the shelf, you can then break it down into uh, reefs with different amounts of live coral cover. And this is that one I highlighted that had been severely impacted by the bleaching with very little coral cover sitting there on its own. And I guess the only other thing I want to say about this is that um, the management zone had very little um, in way of uh, driving these reef fish assemblage structures. Um, and even when we looked at uh, coral trout individually, there wasn't a great difference between green and blue zones from broad data. So I guess that suggests that uh, 
using measures such as relative abundance of, of max n is a pretty coarse way of getting at this uh, zoning issue. But a lot of this was driven by environmental variables like topographic complexity, uh, visibility, but interestingly also sand. And when we dug down further into it, it turned out that <coughs> by some chance, a lot of the drops that we did in the green zone actually landed on the sand. So that's why that was a, a driving, um, driving variable there. The, probably the last component we look at in our uh, intensive surveys is for agents of coral mortality. Um, so we do this along the fixed transects. They're um, five by, uh, sorry, a two meter wide belt. And we're looking for incidences of coral disease. And as you can see for uh, white syndrome, SEB, brown band, black band, there was very little um, incidence of coral disease to be found. And that's probably because there wasn't a lot of coral, but um, certainly suggests that the remnants that were there were, were doing okay. <laughs> we also count the number of uh, crown thorn starfish. There were very few of these to be found anywhere uh, on the transects or indeed even during mandatos. Uh, we also look at uh, physical damage. So this is from large storm waves or anchor damage. Um, and interestingly, there was one reef that had 250-odd colonies that had been overturned or smashed. This will give you some sort of an idea of what it looks like. And we put that down to the presence of Cyclone Penny in January. It was only small, but it seemed to pack a bit of a punch. And also the uh, monsoon trough, which ensued um, and produced winds up to 60, 65 knots. That was reported by our vessel when it transited from TI down to Cooktown. And then finally, bleaching. You know, the indications were before the summer that bleaching was a high possibility. Fortunately, that cyclone in the trough came along and has probably saved it from uh, more widespread bleaching. This gives you the number of transects in which bleaching occurred at each reef, and the number in brackets is the severity of it, zero plus in the case that it was just um, individual scattered colonies. We did see uh, on Manitou there were a couple of reefs that had one habitat with up to about 50-60% of the corals were bleached, but um, by and large there was very little bleaching going on when we were there. Okay, so that sums up the Far Northern Expedition. Um, this was a report submitted to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation in June, and if you're interested you can dig your way through the mysteries of our website and find it. Um, or if you can't find it, just drop me a line and I can certainly send you a PDF copy of it. Okay, so every year we, um, we bring out an annual update based on Manitou surveys. So we use these because it's the longest running, most spatially extensive um, surveys that we do. And um, for the purposes of this, we break the Great Barrier Reef up into three broad regions. Um, we do this, I guess, because we know it's a, a large, complex place, but to make it, it the results easily digestible to the greater public, to the stakeholders and the government, you can't be delving into the details of what's happening on each individual reef. And also, just to give a whole GBR-wide summary, kind of, you know, hides all the details as well, so it's kind of a trade-off of the best way of reporting it. And I guess there's a bit of a historical legacy to this as well. This is um, how Glenn Diaz broke it down in that uh, 2012 paper. All that to say, these are all the reefs that have been included in the temporal series. There's about 260 of them. Um, this year we managed to get around 64-ish, I think. So, what's been happening? A lot of you have probably seen these figures, but in the far northern GBR, um, in the last year, we've basically seen a stabilisation of uh, hard coral cover. In fact, it's increased slightly from 11% uh, in 2017 to 14% this year. However, you know, it's still close to the lowest levels it's ever been, and there was evidence of continued disturbances there. And as I mentioned, um, we were unable to do a lot of those inshore reefs, which I think if had been included in this analysis probably would have dragged this point down uh, to parity or even below. So 
you take that increase with a, a slight grain of salt, in my opinion. Just a little pictorial run through. This is that reef 11049 that had been impacted by bleaching. Um, this was kind of the dominant view of a lot of dead standing um, coral skeletons covered in turf algae. And um, again, impacts from storm damage. Uh, this probably would have been a really beautiful field of branching acropora. Um, it was absolutely smashed. This went on for a couple of hundred metres. And we're pretty confident that the cause of this was in fact the storm or the, um, the monsoon trough as a lot of this was remnant live um, fragments, but also you can see there's a lot of just uh, recently settled green turf algae on it. So it was really recent damage and we were there um, a week or two after the passage of, of that particular storm. I mentioned the low level of bleaching mainly restricted to scattered individual colonies, but as I mentioned, there were um, two reefs that had up to about 50, 60% of bleaching on it. And I think we dodged a bullet on that one this uh, last summer. But what was heartening for me is there were a lot of areas of intact coral assemblages. You know, there was a lot of sites like this, um, mainly down the slope. The, the crests were all looking pretty shabby, but um, certainly, as you look down the slope, you can see really healthy communities on a lot of those reefs, which was mildly surprising to me. But I guess that suggests possibly there was a bit of a depth refuge from um, the impacts of the bleaching. One other thing I want to highlight here is the impact of cumulative disturbances on parallel assemblages. Um, this is from our survey reefs around Lizard Island. As you can see, they're all in really bad shape at the moment. Um, low, less than 10% coral on most of them. And we have uh, fixed sites on these that have been there since the early 90s. And when you look at the temporal series for each of those reefs, you can see the fine loads they've been doing pretty well up until about 2011 when we had the start of the Crown Thorns outbreak, followed by two really intense, severe tropical cyclones and then of course the bleaching. And when you look at what's happened to the coral assemblages since 2011, so it's 2011 to nine for each of these categories of coral, these are all the different growth forms of acropora, branching, digitate, encrusting, so massive, tabular, bottle brush, and then the same for non acropora <coughs> corals. What you can see is that the impact of those years since 2011 has been to basically eradicate the whole um, acropolis section of the community. And what's left then is you know, massive corals, um, some submassive corals. So it's a really depauperate community. And um, I think really highlights that you know, these cumulative impacts really can um, wreak large havoc on, on coral communities. Okay, moving down further to the central GBR, this year we've seen continued coral decline. Okay, so it's gone from 14% in 2018 um, to 12%. Siri, shut up. <laughs> uh, to 12% this year. And again, that's close to the lowest levels we've ever recorded. Okay, there was this little increase here, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but it was immediately reversed and we're now down to the closest. Uh, closest to lowest levels we've seen in the time series. Um, and this year it's definitely largely due to the Crown Thorns outbreaks, which are in uh, quite large numbers on the reefs off Townsville. Um, these surveys also captured the impact of Cyclone Debbie around the Whit Sundays. It's the first time we've been back there since uh, the passage of that storm. And the mid and inner shelf reefs in the Whit Sundays have all undergone extensive degradation with coral cover dropping to around or below 5%. Surprisingly, when we looked at the outer shelf reefs off the Whit Sundays, they were in really excellent condition. So I guess that really highlights that the orientation of the sites to the track of the storm is really important in terms of classifying the degradation due to those events. And again, as I mentioned, crown of thorns are in huge numbers in reefs uh, 
well, off Townsville now, but certainly in the reporting period, uh, reefs off Innisfail had exceptionally high densities of crown of thorns. And despite the efforts of the, um, the Cots Culling team, we've continued to see degradation on, on a large number of reefs across the central region. Right, moving down to the far south, um, as uh, one previously employed professor said, there was a 250% increase in coral cover in the southern GDR, but this has been reversed immediately. And I'll come back to, to this point in a little bit. So coral covers continue to decline. I guess you could call it stabilisation. It's only a 1% decline this year. And that's really due to disparate trends in coral cover in the swains and also the Capricorn bunkers. So in the swains, as I'm sure you've all heard, there was a, a massive outbreak of, of cots and um, a lot of <coughs> reefs have uh, lost pretty much all of their coral. Um, conversely, in the Capricorn bunkers, uh, those reefs have been going gangbusters. Um, individual reefs sit at between 60 and 80 percent coral cover around the whole reef, so that's pretty good. Um, but there's also indications that crown of thorns have ramped up down in the bunkers this year as well. Um, we have seen crown of thorns down there before, but um, they've usually been restricted. But this is just a, a little series to show you the impacts. Uh, Jenkins Reef is in the, the middle of the Swains. It was 60-70% coral cover in 2017. Um, then Cots came along and it's now been reduced down to about 3 or 4%. So huge impacts from these beasts. Uh, and this is one of the reef slopes, I think, at Wreck Island in the Capricorn Bunkers. So looking really, really healthy. These are a really interesting group of reefs, you know, they're exposed to oceanic swells, so they've undergone these boom-bust cycles of hard coral cover where um, this uh, community composed of table and branching of crop river reach really high levels and then a storm will come along and smash it back to pretty much zero. And that's occurred three or four times during the time series that we've had. Uh, as I said, cots are now into it. There's reports of it at Heron, at Lady Musgrave, at Bolt. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where they're actually at when we get down there in January. Um, we've seen them down there before, but they've usually been localised on the back reefs and never make it round into this sort of habitat. So I guess it's a watch this space to see um, what kind of impact they have in the bunkers. Okay, I'm actually well ahead of time. Um, <laughs> that's okay. We can all go and get some lunch. Slow, by the way. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and then this is just a summary of, of the annual change in coral cover since our last surveys, and we're only kind of going back to reefs where we've done them in the last two years. And that's where we kind of got our headline for the annual report, the mixed bill of health. Okay, we've seen reefs that have increased in coral cover, so the green dots are obviously increases, red are decreases, and the size is the magnitude of the change. Um, which is quite heartening. I mean, even though coral cover is still really low around Lizard Island, we've seen some increases of 1% to 2%, but by and large, there's still ongoing degradation from cyclones and cots scattered down the whole length of the GDR. Um, I'll just briefly touch on juvenile corals again. So, um, as I mentioned, we do these on all of our intensive surveys. And when you plot out the numbers across the whole GDR, um, you can see that there were, we're defining them as moderate to high densities of juveniles. These are numbers per metre squared. And uh, a paper came out a few years ago that suggested that a threshold of, of 4.6 per metre squared should encourage future recovery. But the caveat being only in the absence of future disturbance. So, What's the chance of the GDR not having future disturbances and recovering? It's actually a pretty grim story. So we maintain a um, pretty extensive database of all the disturbances. Um, and this figure looks a little horrendous, but I'll quickly walk you through it. Uh, so we have the northern, central, southern GDR. We've got time along the x-axis. For the top panel, it's the percentage of our survey reefs that are impacted by 
bleaching in red, um, cots in green, and cyclones in blue. So the first point I want to make is, as we all know, GBR is a large, complex place, it's very dynamic, lots of disturbances going on, and there's never been a year on the GBR where there hasn't been a disturbance somewhere. But the concerning trend for me is that the spatial extent and severity of these disturbances are now increasing in this, particularly in the last five years and particularly in the northern and central GDR. And you can actually then model the probability of an individual survey reef being impacted by a disturbance, which are what these bottom series of panels are. And you can see that since uh, the time series began, the probability of, of bleaching, severe categories of bleaching occurring, have ramped up substantially through the decades. That's highly significant. Similarly, the incidence or frequency of cyclones has uh, increased through the time series. These are statistically significant increases. Um, and COTS have just been trucking along as they always do. So there's always been outbreaks somewhere. But what this is saying then is that the, the frequency of those disturbances is increasing. The spatial extent of those disturbances is increasing. So that means there's you know, much less time in between those disturbance events to allow for recovery. And that's a really concerning trend. And that's kind of what was predicted under climate change in the future, but we're actually seeing it today in this data set. And then what that means for the potential of recovery of the GBR is also pretty grim. So here's the, the latest figures presented slightly differently as points rather than just trend lines. I'll draw your attention to the southern GBR um, to uh, explain what I mean. So if we're going to consider recovery, it's, you need to have some kind of threshold that you're going to recover back to, and I will posit here that we're going to call it the highest point we've ever seen, which was in 1988 at about 45% regional wide. There's a lot of ways you can um, define recovery, but in this case I'm going to say that for recovery to occur, you have to have mean coral cover post-disturbance get back to that threshold level. And despite numerous instances of disturbance in the beginning of recovery, that's never happened. We've never seen full regional recovery in the southern GBR. And when you draw a trend line through it, some people hate me for this, it's tracking down and it's highly significant. And then just to show you that I'm not cherry picking, I'll put a trend on the rest of them, and it's all the same story, although the rate obviously differs among regions. I guess the last thing I want to say is, we did see regional recovery occur once, it was in the central GDR, but it took 30 years, and then it was immediately reversed by the bleaching and by COTS, and it's now close back to the lowest levels we've ever seen. So that's pretty much all I've got. That went a lot quicker than I thought. Um, I'll, I'll just drag out the summary if you like. <laughs> so we know that since 2011, the GDR has been uh, subject to a lot of intense disturbances. You know, we've had crown of thorns, we've had bleaching, we've had cyclones. Certainly the northern GBR has copped the brunt of that and there's widespread degradation across much of that region. There is small glimmers of hope, there's still reefs out there that still look pretty good with intact coral populations. But I guess the really important question is what effect have those cumulative disturbances had on things like physiology, reproduction? You know, we've seen massive decreases in the amount of settlement and recruitment on corals. Um, so the fact that there are those intact populations is positive, but we really don't know what the, the flow on effects to subsequent recruitment and, and recovery is going to be. In the far north, we saw um, substantial differences in target fish abundances between zones, more in the green zones. That's a nice little positive message. It's completely expected and in line with what we've seen previously. And as I've pointed out a couple of times now, it's sounding a bit repetitive, but the abundant juvenile corals across the GBR should ensure recovery, but it's this in the absence of further disturbance. So I would put to you that the GBR is still great, 
but it's really, it's struggling, you know, and I think it's important to not perpetuate the doom and gloom all the time. I think it's nice to be able to put out some positive messages every now and then, particularly because a lot of people are dependent on this place for their livelihood, but also, you know, if you just keep pumping out bad messages, people are just going to turn off and then we've half lost our, our reason to keep fighting. The worrying thing, of course, was that the, the disturbance regime now means that the intervals for recovery have shortened to the point where we haven't seen full regional recovery. And in effect, coral cover has been, to quote um, Chuck Berkland, ratcheting down over the 30 odd years of the data set. So I think unless we're going to get serious and take immediate action on climate change and carbon emissions, you know, we're really going to struggle to keep it great. And uh, that's a lot of